Hello, welcome to lecture 23 of ELEC ENG 2 CI5. We'll start in this lecture talk about sinusoidal signals and how to analyze linear circuits with sinusoidal excitation. This is the AC part, it's a very important part. We use it very often in electrical engineering to analyze all type of circuits um, like filters, uh, oscillators and so on. Um, so I will will start in this lecture to to give some fundamental concepts, and in the next uh, couple of lectures we'll start to introduce the concept of an impedance admittance, uh, how to get to the current phasers and voltage phasers and so on. But they all really try to solve a linear circuit with a sinusoidal excitation. First, we have to be very fluent about the way we handle sinusoidal signal. Um, a sinusoidal signal is given by three quantities, uh, by an amplitude, this is, it can be any value, uh, depending on the strength of the signal, an angular frequency, a radian per second, and phase of a radian, or degrees actually, this phase can be in radian or in degrees. Uh, these three quantities, A, the amplitude A, or AV here, it's called the AV because it's the amplitude of a voltage, um, and the angular frequency and the phase shift, these are the three fundamental uh, quantities that define a sinusoidal signal. And we take our reference as a cosine signal. So when a phase is zero, you get cosine omega t. Okay. Um, so by by having by knowing these three parameters for any sinusoidal signal, the sinusoidal signal is is uniquely determined, and you should be able to draw it as a function of time. Let's take a look at some examples of sinusoidal signals. First one is uh, 3 sine 120 uh, pi t plus 60 degrees. The other one is uh, 10 cosine 150 t minus 120 degrees. And then the third one is 0 0.5 cosine 120 pi t plus 270 degrees. Okay, let's take a look at the solution of the first part. Uh, the signal that we have here is uh, 3 sine 120 by t plus 60 degrees. So the amplitude is 3, this is, this is no problem, omega is still the same. Uh, but remember we are comparing this one to, to a cosine waveform. We, we take our reference as a cosine omega t. So this signal should be written as a cosine omega t plus phi. A sinusoidal signal with certain waveform is a cosine signal that was shifted by minus 90 degrees. So you can replace this one here, the sine, with a cosine, but subtract 90 from the phase. So when I'm going to put phi here, I'm not going to take phi as 60 degrees, because this phi is relative to cosine, while this is 60 is this 60 is relative to a sine. So I'm going to subtract 90 degrees from this 60, and this is going to give me the phi. So now, if you compare these two together, this is this is 3, cosine 120 by t plus 60 minus 90. This is how we should write this one. So the amplitude is equal to 3. This is omega. This is the angular frequency. It's 120 pi. If you want to get the frequency itself in hertz, you divide this quantity by 2 pi. So 120 pi by 2 pi, this will give you 60 hertz. So this means that the periodic time the time that takes this signal to make one complete period is 1 over the frequency. So 1 over 60, so it's 16.667 milli, milli, uh, milliseconds. Of course, it's not a milliampere here. <laughs> it's milliseconds, so I let me correct this one here. So this millisecond. And uh, the last thing I would like to mention is that the phase, if, if it is a sign, it's 60 degrees. But because every sign signal is a cosine signal that was shifted by minus 90 degrees. So it was shifted to the right, to the positive time by 90 degrees. So I'm going to subtract minus 90 degrees from this one. So it's minus 30 degrees. So this signal is really, this signal that we have is 3 cosine 120 by t minus 60, minus 30 degrees. Okay, so as a cosine, it is 3 cosine 120 by t minus 30 degrees. Okay, so let's take a look at this signal. Uh, so this is this is this is a cosine waveform here. We agreed it was shifted by minus thirty degrees, and minus thirty degrees phase shift means if you have if you have phase shift to negative, this means that the signal was moved in the positive time direction. So this is this is time zero for the cosine. It should have been here, 
but it was moved in the positive time by by 30 degrees okay and the amplitude here is 3 as we agreed and the, this this periodic wave waveform or the periodic time 16.667 uh, seconds milliseconds um, so and you, as well there is another way of looking at it you can look at it as a sine wave but it was moved in the negative time by 60 degrees so this is a sine wave here this is the beginning of the sine but this sign should have been here but you can see it was moved in the negative time by 60 degrees so remember when we add both phase shift this equivalent to shifting the signal to the left towards negative time but when we add a negative phase shift this equivalent to moving the signal to the right in the direction of positive time now let's take a look at this other example uh, this is v2 of t is equal to 10 cosine 150 t minus 120 degrees this is a cosine waveform so everything we can write it as a cosine omega t plus phi so a here the amplitude is 10 omega the angular frequency is 150 radian per second if you want to get the corresponding frequency you divide this one by 2 pi so 150 divided by 2 pi which is 6.28 you get 23.885 hertz so remember we can get the frequency from the angular frequency by dividing by 2 pi uh, the periodic time is 1 over the frequency so the time of one period in time is 1 over this frequency you divide this get the inverse of this one you get 41.8 milliseconds the last thing the phase shift here is minus 120 degrees so this equivalent to shifting the um, the signal in the positive time direction by 180 degrees so this is a cosine the cosine this this is a, this is the zero of a non-shifted cosine but this zero as you could see it was moved in the positive time by 120 degrees so when this phase shift is negative this means that we shift the signal to the right by by this phase shift that we have here one other thing to add to notice here is that if you want to calculate the time or the this the value of this cosine at any time if you want to calculate the value of this one at any time you multiply 150 by this time and then you add the phase shift but notice even though we write this phase shift in degrees it must be added in region so we have to convert this one in region so this phase shift we can write it in region or in degrees but when we sum the sum these two together they have to be in region the reason is this is radian per second so when you multiply it by second you get radian so this will always be radians so you cannot add radians to degrees so they have to convert first 120 degrees divided by uh, by pi by 180 and they multiply by pi 3.14 and this will convert this one to the corresponding radians and then you add it to this amount okay this is a very important thing to notice uh, when you do this calculation this is radian per second this is second so when you multiply them you get radians so you cannot add degrees to radians you have to convert this one first to, to radians so even though we can write it write the phase shift as uh, in terms of degrees but when we sum them we must sum them in as radians okay let's take a look at the third example the third example is 0 0.5 cosine 120 uh, pi t plus 270 degrees the amplitude here is 0.5 uh, the uh, the angular frequency is 120 by we, we have seen this one earlier uh, so we divide this by 2 by you get the frequency of 60 Hertz we did the calculation as well for the periodic time which is 1 over F so we divide 1 over 60 you get 16.667 milliseconds now um, uh, this one here we have a positive phase shift to 270 degrees so you take the cosine and you shift it in the in the negative time by 270 degrees but this is a, a large shift so we know that a cosine will still be a cosine if you subtract 2 by from the phase so I'm gonna subtract 2 by from this one 2, 2 by 360 so 270 minus 360 will give me minus 90 so minus 90 means I, I we are going to shift the cosine by 90 degrees in the positive time so this is the zero of an unshifted cosine so we shifted by nine shifted it by 90 degrees in the positive time so it doesn't matter if you want to use 270 you feel comfortable with that is fine but this means you have to take the signal and you shift it you shift it to the negative time by uh, this amount okay which is large shift or you can simply subtract from the, from the whole phase 
360 degrees because this does not really make any difference and this 270 degrees becomes minus 90 degrees so the waveform is exactly equivalent to shifting uh, the cosine in the positive time by 90 degrees okay so these two are equivalent and I used it that way this is easier for me so the amplitude is 0.5 the periodic time the periodic the one the period the time of one period is 16.667 milliseconds and the phase shift here is minus 90 degrees so we sh we shifted the cosine it was supposed to the, the zero should be here we shifted the positive time by 90 degrees so remember when you have a negative phase shift this means you move the signal in the positive time when you have a positive phase shift you move the signal in the negative time we talked before in previous lectures about the concept of, concept of lead lag. I mentioned it in some of the examples, and here is about time to discuss the game. Um, this, is, this is a cosine waveform, and this is another cosine waveform, but its phase is, is, is leading the other one by phi. So the phase of the red signal here is a cosine omega t plus phi, while the phase of the black signal is a cosine omega t. So we say that the signal V2 leads the signal V1 by phi. The reason for this is if you can see here, the zero, the zero of this cosine, of the black cosine here, appears at time zero, while the zero of the other one will appear at a time of minus phi. So it's gonna appear at an earlier time, or at a phase shift of minus phi. So it's gonna appear at an earlier time. So this is why we say that the, lead, the red signal leads the black signal, okay? It's very important to notice that. So um, this lead lag relationships are extremely important as we, as we start to discuss phasers. So just keep this one in mind. Um, a signal of this form, a cosine omega t plus phi, leads a signal of the form, a cosine omega t by an angle of phi. And you can draw them, of course, and you see, you see that, the, that the peak of this red signal will appear before the peak of the black signal by a certain time. So this is why we say that the red signal will lead this black signal here. The same concept can be said when you have a negative phase shift. So you have a sine omega t minus phi and a sine omega t. We say that the signal a sine omega t minus phi lags the signal a sine omega t by an angle of phi. Let's take a look at why is that. This is v1 of t. This is a sine omega t. It's a sine signal. It is zero at time zero. The other signal a sine omega t minus phi. So the, this signal, because you have here, phi and phi is positive, because you have this negative phi, this equivalent to moving the signal in the positive time. So you can see the zero was moved, the, the, the zero of the original sign was moved from time zero to another positive time, okay? So this is now the signal A sine omega t minus phi. This is the red signal. So we can see that the black signal leads the red signal, okay? The, it, it leads it by a certain time, corresponding to this phase shift phi. So we say that um, v, v1 of t will lead v2 of t, or that v2 of t lags behind v1 of t by uh, an angle of phi. Okay? So uh, the reason, again, if you try to see that the beak of the black one will appear earlier than the beak of the red one. So we say that the black one leads the red one, or the red one lags behind the... the the black one okay so um so this is this concept we use it very often when we discuss phasers uh that determine the relationships between voltages and currents as we'll see very soon when we analyze ac circuits okay let's take a look at two examples uh we have a circuit with uh, one capacitor of value one microfarad and you apply to that um uh, a cosine a sinusoidal waveform we call actually a cosine or sine both are called sinusoidal sinusoids um, so, uh, so we'd like to calculate I of T here, and uh, here we have a coil, an inductor, and we know the current being pushed through this inductor, and we'd like to find the voltage across the inductor. So uh, we have done similar examples to these ones before, uh, but we maybe we, we applied it for other type of excitations, but here we are using sinusoidal type excitation and would like to determine the corresponding signals. Because these two, the capacitor and the inductor, are both uh, linear components, if the excitation is sinusoidal, the, the, voltage, uh, the voltage across the inductor, say, 
or the current going through the capacitor will also be sinusoidal with the same frequency. So if this is frequency is 100 by radian per second, then the, the voltage here will also, or the current here going through the capacitor will, will also be sinusoidal with the same frequency. But the only difference is that its amplitude and phase will be different. The same thing we can say about the inductor. The voltage across the inductor will also be sinusoidal with a frequency of 100 pi radian per second. But what's going to matter is its amplitude and its phase. So let's see how we do these calculations. We have done similar things in previous examples. Let's do how we do these calculations. Okay, we have you have a capacitor. You know the voltage across the capacitor. You want to get the current through the capacitor. The relationship between the voltage and the current is I is equal to C dVc by dt. And remember, the current of the capacitor is always flowing through the capacitor from positive terminal to the negative terminal. But remember, the capacitor voltage here, which is the voltage between here and here, is the same as the source voltage. And the source voltage is given to us. It is 3 cosine 100 by T. So now we have to differentiate 3 cosine 100 by T. If you differentiate this one, you get minus 3. Uh, and the derivative of 100 by T will give you 100 pi. If you put all this together, you get this current here in milliampere. Okay? So what you could see that with the, the signal that we applied to, the, uh, to the, the, the voltage that we applied was a cosine. Okay? It was a cosine waveform. It is this black signal. Okay? But the current was minus sign. Minus sign means it goes down here and then goes up again. But its peak appears earlier than the voltage. And this is something that we know from earlier examples that for the case of the capacitor, the current in the capacitor will lead the voltage in the capacitor. So this is the voltage across the capacitor. It's a cosine, but the current leads because it's a minus sign. And you see the peak of the sign, minus sign appears before the peak of the cosine. Okay? Um, so this is very important to understand. So we say that for a capacitor, the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees. And remember, a sine, a sine waveform, a minus sine waveform leads a cosine waveform by this angle, and this angle is 90 degrees. Okay, very important to remember this. We do the same analysis for inductor. You have an inductor, and you are pushing current through it through this current source. Then the voltage across the inductor will also be sinusoidal. Uh, we, the equation that we have is that the inductor current, inductor voltage, is equal to L di L by dt, where I is the inductor current. But this inductor current is the same as the source current. You can see the source current is, is the one pushing the current in the inductor. So di s by dt. So the inductor here is 1 milli Henry, so we put 10 to the minus 3. Then we have to differentiate sine 100 by t. The derivative of the sine, you get a cosine, and you multiply by the, by the derivative of the angle, so you multiply by 100 by t. So 100, sorry, 100 pi. So 100 pi, you multiply by 10 to the minus 3 of 10.1 pi. Okay? So here, if you try to plot this one, this is what we have. This, is, this was the current that you applied. It was a sine waveform. Okay? But this is the voltage that you got across the inductor. It's a cosine waveform. And you can see the peak of the cosine appears here, while the peak of the sine appears here. So this means that the voltage leads the current. Okay? And this is something we know very well from our study of inductors, that the voltage, if you have a sinusoidal excitation, the voltage across the inductor will lead the current going through the inductor by 90 degrees. Okay? One other thing I should mention, even though I'm drawing them in the same scale, it should be understood that this one will be in, this one, the, the voltage will be in volts, while the current will be in milliampere or amperes. But I draw them in the same scale just to illustrate the, the, uh, the, the lead lag relationship between these different quantities. Okay, we move now to discuss linear circuits. We agreed that all the circuits we discussed in this course are linear circuits. The inductor, the, the resistor is given by the relationship V is equal to IR, and the inductor is given by the relationship phi is the flux is equal to LI, the inductance multiplying the current, and the capacitor is given by the relationship Q is equal to CV. So the, the charge across the capacitor is linearly proportional to the voltage across the capacitor, and the, line, the constant of proportionality is the capacitance. All these linear circuits, they have a fundamental relationship. They do not change frequency. Meaning, if you put a sinusoidal source with frequency 100 hertz, 
all the currents and all the voltages everywhere will also be sinusoidal with a frequency 100 Hertz okay so at steady state all all these quantities have the same frequency they only differ in their amplitude and their phase so this is really the only difference that we should worry about so keep this one in mind all if you, all the circuits that we have in this course are linear circuits so if you apply a sinusoidal voltage source with certain frequency then at steady state all the currents and voltages everywhere in the circuit will be also sinusoidal and when i mean steady state i don't mean here steady state in the dc sense i mean the time enough time have passed to auto for all transient to die out and the circuit to reach steady state condition if you if it reaches steady state condition air the currents and voltages everywhere will also be sinusoidal with the same frequency but with different amplitudes and phase let's take a look at an example to illustrate this concept we have here a linear circuit a resistor in series a capacitor and we have here a sinusoidal waveform would like to find the differential equation governing this circuit this is not a problem we can write that and would like to assume a steady state value of the capacitor ac cosine omega t plus phi c and then try to find phi c and try to find ac because i know the frequency omega it is the same frequency as my source so this is the source i'm applying so we i know that the current flowing here will also sinusoidal the voltage across the resistor will also be sinusoidal the capacitor voltage will also be sinusoidal all of them are sinusoidal signals with the same frequency but they differ only in the amplitude and the phase so I'm going to here assume for the capacitor voltage that it has an amplitude of AC and has a phase shift of phi C. And my target now is that using the differential equation I wrote, I wrote earlier to get AC and phi C. So we write the differential equation right governing this circuit. This is the equation that we have is that the voltage here at any time is equal to the drop across the resistor plus the drop across or plus the voltage across the capacitor this is this is kvl and kvl as we agreed it applies for time varying circuits at any time so the current going through here is the capacitor current okay the current and the, and the capacitor's current is given by c dvc by dt so the equation is vs which is a source of voltage is equal to i r plus c so this is the first one but i the current flowing in the circuit is the capacitor current. So it can be written as C dVC by dT. We can reorganize things a little bit, divide both sides by RC. So you get dVC by dT here, plus 1R over RCVC, plus Vs over RC. And we know the source. The source is nothing but A cosine omega T over RC. So this is a differential equation governing the circuit. dVC by dT, plus 1 over RC multiplied by C, VC of T is equal to A over RC cosine omega T. A is given, this is the amplitude of the source. Omega is given, this is the frequency of the source. The values of R and C are given. What is missing here in this equation is how to solve for VC, how to get VC as a function of time. So we're gonna, because we know it has to be sinusoidal signal with the same frequency omega, and we're going to assume this form for it. And then we will use this form and then substitute into this equation. So if we differentiate this one relative to T, this equivalent differentiating this one relative to T, so you get minus AC multiplying omega sine omega T plus phi C. And then 1 over RC VC, then replace VC by this cosine. This is equal to A over RC cosine omega T. So this is now the equation after I substituted with the template of the capacitor voltage in order to be able to, to find some useful equations here i have a cosine i have i have here an angle omega t plus phi c I have an angle omega t plus phi c so i'm going to write, write uh, the expansion of sine omega t plus phi c it's going to be sine omega t cosine phi c plus cosine omega t sine phi c and then we're going to write the expansion of cosine omega t plus phi c into cosine omega t cosine phi c minus sine omega t sine phi c what i'm trying to do here is to have everything as one term multiplying cosine omega t and one term multiplying sine omega t and then we equate them to the right hand side which is the excitation so i did i did this part i expanded the sine this is the expansion of the sine of the summation of two terms 
this expansion of the cosine of the summation of two terms. So now I have sine omega t here, I have sine omega t here, but there is no sine omega t in the other side. So I can simply say that this coefficient plus this coefficient must be equal to zero. While I have here cosine omega t in the right hand side, I have cosine omega t here, I have cosine omega t here, so I can simply say that this term plus this term will be equal to this term. Because this, and we can do that because the cosine and sine are orthogonal signals. Okay, so we're gonna, what we're going to do right now is going to equate the coefficients of sine omega t in the right hand and the left hand side to zero, and the coefficients of cosine omega t in the left hand side to a over rc. So this is what we do. So this one will give a minus ac omega cosine phi c minus ac over rc sine phi c is equal to zero because there is no sine omega t in the right hand side. Now we equate the coefficients of cosine omega t minus ac omega sine phi phi c plus ac over rc cosine phi c is equal to a over rc. This is what we have here. So the, now I equated the two coef the coefficients of cosine omega t in both sides. I equated the coefficients of sine omega t in both sides. The good thing about this second equation here, I can label this one as equation 2. I can write it here as equation number 2. Equation number 2, I can get rid of AC, and I end up only with one equation in phi C. Because AC is on both sides, you have 0. Uh, so you get this equation. This will give you 10 phi C. So I can simply say that 10 phi C is equal to minus omega RC, and then I can get the angle phi C. What's phi C? Okay, so I know this angle here, so this is fine. Once you have known, you have known this angle, I can substitute into this equation. I know phi C, I can remove cosine phi C, I can remove sine phi C, and then I can solve for AC. Okay, so this is the way to find the solution. Uh, of course, I'm doing it symbolically, so I will keep it as it is. This is only one equation in phi C. I can solve it for phi C. This will give me tan phi tangent of phi C is equal to minus omega RC. So I can get phi C. If I know R and C and omega, I can get phi C. Once I have no phi C, I've known phi C, I go back here again. I know A, I know RC, I know now phi C. The only missing term is AC. I can solve for AC, which is the amplitude of the capacitor voltage. Okay, so this is one way of doing it, and of course I could have done this with numbers, I'm just showing you symbolically how you can do this derivation here for the capacitor voltage. The last thing I would like to mention in this lecture is the concept of complex forcing functions. We are used to using a, a, a waveform or a source of value cosine omega t, it has a sinusoidal waveform cosine or sine. But there's something called the Euler equation, say that e to the j omega t is cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. So the basic idea here is use a complex, complex excitation as e to the j omega t, and after you have done the analysis, take the real part, and this real part will give you a response. And the basis for that is that e to the j omega t is cosine omega t plus j sine omega t, so the real part of e to the g omega t is cosine omega t. So, and this is really this is really the fundamental idea. Analyze any linear circuits using complex excitation and complex response, and then take the real part, and this will give you the, the actual response, the actual time domain response you are looking for. This concept is very simple, and I will illustrate it through one example. Uh, we have here a series R LC circuit, so this is a second order circuit. would like to solve for the steady state current using the complex forcing function. So what we are going to be doing, we'll write the differential equation governing this circuit, and then we will replace this excitation here by a complex excitation. So this is not going to be Vm cosine omega t, it's Vm e to the j omega t. And then we do our analysis, and then at the end we take the real part to determine the, the, uh, the currents and the voltages everywhere. So let's see how this will be done. We start first by writing the differential equation governing this circuit. So this equation, we, as you can see, we have three components connected in series. So I have here, uh, this is called uh, VL, and this one here is called VC, and this one here is called VR, 
there is a current flowing here I and this resistance is R, this is L and this is C. Okay, so we can simply say here that the voltage across the source at any time is equal to the drop across the resistor plus, the, plus VL plus VC. Uh, the current, the, cur the voltage across the resistor is equal to IR. The voltage across the inductor is the derivative of the current, which is the same current, so L di by dt. Remember, the current flowing in all three components is the same. And the last thing, the voltage across the capacitor is the integral of the current. This is 1 over C, the integral from minus infinity to ti of tau d tau. So in order to get the integration, to, we don't want to have an integral differential equation. We differentiate both sides. So you get here dVs by dt, the derivative of the source. This is our source here. This will give me here di by dt multiplying r. This will give me second order derivative L di squared i by dt squared. And this one here will give me i of t divided by, divided by c. So we differentiated both sides once to get rid of this integral. So this now looks like it's a differential equation, a second order differential equation. We know that our source is a cosine omega t, but I'm going to be using complex forcing functions. So I'm going to write this one as a multiplying e to the g omega t. This is now is my excitation. It's a sinusoidal signal. Its amplitude is a and its phase is zero. But I'm not going to write it as a cosine omega t. I will write it as a e to the g omega t. Now the current, my, my target is to solve this differential equation for the current. So I'm going to assume the current to have this form here, i e to the g phi e to the g omega t. So it has an amplitude of i, it has a phase shift of phi, and it's still sinusoidal with frequency omega t. This is what this means. Remember, you can combine these two together, and this will give you omega t plus phi, because the phase shift is omega t plus phi. So remember, even though we bought a source of, um, of angle 0, because a cosine omega t, the current may lead or lag the voltage. So this is why we have to include this angle here. So my target now is to find i and find phi. Because omega is the angular frequency, is the same as the source angular frequency. This is a linear circuit, it does not change frequency. So what I'm going to be doing, I will take this form here and substitute into this differential equation. And I will take this expression for the source. This is called the phasor of the source or the, it's a complex, the corresponding complex um, uh, complex forcing function. I'm going to take this one, I will substitute here. I'm going to take I and substitute here. This is, I'm going to take this one, substitute here as well, <clears throat> and proceed to do my calculations. <clears throat> so keep in mind, I have to differentiate here this one twice. So we start to do these manipulations here. Um, we substituted for the source, as you can see here, a e to the g omega t, and the source is differentiated once. I differentiated the current twice, and then I multiplied it by L. But remember, the current is i e to the j phi e to the g omega t. So when you differentiate it once relative to t, you're actually multiplying by g omega. So when you differentiate it twice, you multiply by g omega, g omega squared, which is minus omega squared. Okay, so this one here, you can see this minus omega squared is nothing but the derivative to time with respect to time twice. Because when you differentiate e to the j omega t relative to t, you get j omega e to the j omega t. If you differentiate once more, you get j omega squared, all squared, multiplying e to j omega t. j squared will give you minus 1, and the omega squared will give you omega squared. Now, this term here is the derivative relative to time only once. So you can see this is a current i e to the j phi e to the j omega t. If you differentiate only once, you get j omega, which is this one here, multiplying e to j omega t. And this one here is the current itself without anything, dividing it by r. So I substituted for the uh, for the current with the, its corresponding complex expression. Okay, it is i e to the j phi e to the j omega t. This one takes into account that it's a sinusoidal. It has an amplitude i, which I don't know. It has a phase phi, which I don't know. It has an, an angular frequency omega, which I do know because it is the same as the source. Now, what's going to happen now? We expand this. Um, you differentiate this one once. 
you get uh, g omega h g omega t you will notice that e to the g omega t appears appears in both sides so you can get rid of e to the g omega t and this is something i want you to keep in mind because when we analyze ac circuits later we are not going to be mentioning time anymore i'm just showing you here why time is going to disappear because you assume the form e to the g omega t but it appeared here, it appeared here, it appeared here, it appeared in the left in the left hand side. So I, I removed it from all sides. So you end up only with, with this complex equation. So we can solve this equation for i e to the g phi. And this is what I did here. I wrote i e to the g phi. Uh, then you multiply both sides by c. This will give you here g omega c a. And this becomes minus omega squared l c. This becomes g omega rc so if you divide this one by uh, the take take i e to the j phi out and then you divide this what we'll end up having so this this is telling you something very interesting i don't know i the amplitude of my current i don't know phi the phase of my current but i know omega the angular frequency of the source i know the value of the capacitor i know the amplitude of the source i know the value of the inductor I know the value of the resistor, so this all is known. This is known as a complex number, okay? So, in your previous course in complex numbers, you can solve this equation for i and phi. If you take the modulus of both sides, the modulus of e to the j phi will give you 1, so you get that the i is equal to uh, the modulus of the numerator divided by the modulus of the denominator. So it will give you omega c a divided by a square root of this term squared plus this term squared. Remember, if you have complex number, the modulus of the complex number is the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. This one here is purely real, while this one here is purely imaginary because multiplying j. So the modulus of the denominator here is square root of this term squared plus this term squared. While this one here is purely imaginary, so its modulus is omega C A. I can get, get phi as well because phi is the angle of the of the left hand side and it's the angle of the right hand side. So the angle you have here J, J gives the angle of pi over 2. So it's pi over 2. The angle of the numerator, it's the omega C A has an angle of 0. And then the angle of the denominator, it will give you minus inverse tangent omega R C over 1 minus omega squared LC. So remember when we have two numbers divided by one another, then the angle, the total angle of this complex number is the angle of the numerator minus the angle of the denominator. The angle of the numerator here is by over 2 because of this J. The angle of the denominator is inverse tangent of omega RC divided by 1 minus omega squared LC. It is the imaginary part, the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, divided by the real part. So, we were able to obtain i by taking the modulus of both sides. We were able to obtain phi by taking the angle of both sides. We could have got the same result. I'm, little, I'm doing a little bit jumping ahead right now. If you consider the inductor to be, it had to, had to offer something like a resistance with value g omega l, and the capacitor to offer something like a resistance called 1 over g omega c. And then you simply say that my current is equal to the to the um, to the my source divided by r plus g omega l plus 1 over g omega c. This believe it, believe it or not, this gives you exactly the same answer like the techniques we used earlier. Okay? And later I will be explaining to you why an inductor represents something we call an impedance of value g omega l and why a capacitor represents an impedance of 1 over g omega c. Right now, I am showing you if you treat this like three resistances connected in series and give this one value r, this, this one value g omega l, give this one 1 over g omega c, and you simply say that the current flowing here is equal to the voltage divided by u3, you get exactly the same answer. Okay? So it's, it's going to be exactly the same, the same behavior. Um, I'm missing here, I, I multiplied both sides here by j omega c, so I'm missing here a in the numerator, I'm glad I, I realized this, so there is a missing here, okay? If you compare this one to the form we had earlier, you see that this is exactly the same thing that we had earlier. The source has an amplitude of a, and I treated d3 as if there are three resistances. I multiplied b both uh, here by j omega c, 
So this becomes Rg omega C. This becomes minus omega squared LC. This becomes 1. So this exactly is the same form we had earlier. And from this one, I can get the amplitude and the phase of the current. I'm going to explain more to you about this later. I just want you to know that we could, obtain, we could have obtained exactly the same answer by treating these uh, three components in, in series. Each one of them is offering its own, I'm going to call it right now, uh, resistance, but it's actually called the impedance. And we'll be spending a whole lecture explaining why this is the case.